Greetings, Montana, and hello, world. It's Chris Hislop from the Montana World Affairs Council welcoming you to another session of International Careers Week. This week, we're talking to a huge range of international experts to help us answer one of the most common questions we hear when we travel around the state with our distinguished speakers, maybe they're ambassadors or military leaders or international experts, students and people around the state always ask, how did you get the job that you do? How did you end up doing this? What can I do to explore a similar career path? So we've put together a veritable smorgasbord of amazing internationalists who are going to talk a little bit about themselves, their careers, and hopefully give us all a little bit of advice on how one might be able to follow a similar career path if you're interested. So teachers and students out there across Montana, if you're interested in the world and your place in it as a career, you're definitely in the right place here. Day three, by the way, of International Careers Week. So if you've missed any of our previous events, they're all on our YouTube channel. Check them out there, the Montana World Affairs Council. So let me now uh, thank very quickly our generous sponsors who help us bring this and so many more programs to you at the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, Allegiance, First Interstate Bank, Trail West Bank, QFI, the High Stakes Foundation, and Longview Foundation. And now to a very special guest, Ambassador Ted Osius is president and CEO of the U.S. ASEAN Business Council. A diplomat for 30 years, Ambassador Osius served from 2014 to 2017 as U.S. Ambassador to Vietnam. In October 2021, he published his most recent book, Nothing is Impossible, America's Reconciliation with Vietnam. I love that title, by the way, with a foreword by former Secretary of State John Kerry, covering the two countries' 25-year journey for adversary. Yeah, there it is right there behind you. Well done. Um, the, it covers the 25-year journey from adversaries to friends and partners. After his departure from government, Osius joined Google Asia Pacific as vice president for government affairs and public policy. Earlier, he was a senior advisor at the Albright Stonebridge Group and the first vice president of Fulbright University of Vietnam. Osius was associate professor at the National War College and senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. As a diplomat, he served all around the world and speaks Vietnamese, French, and Italian, a bit of Japanese, Indonesian, Hindi, Thai, Tuolog, and Greek. Wow. And his husband, Clayton Bond, he has a husband, Clayton Bond, and a son and a daughter. Ambassador Osius, it's great to see you again. I probably should have mentioned that um, we had the honor of hosting you at our Academic World Quest last year. How have you been? Chris, I've been great. I loved my visit to Montana. And I wish I were there with you in person, but I'm glad to be joining you virtually and uh, very happy to, to speak with you and to speak with students. Well, we're, we're really glad to have you. And of course, you know, Ambassador, that um, your travel to Montana came with a standing invitation to return to Montana. Good. Um, or, um, you know, if you're here on vacation or if you'd like to come and speak with our community and student groups, you're always going to be welcome. Thank now, you. Ambassador, it's just been a great week full of uh, extraordinary international expertise, and we're so happy that you could join us to also lend a little bit of your view, your perspective from your distinguished career, you know, not only as a diplomat, but following your career as a diplomat in all kinds of interesting things in a very dynamic region of the world. And so we look forward to hearing a little bit about you, your career path, and some advice you might lend to our students. Over to you. Thanks, Chris. So I, you mentioned I was 30 years, almost 30 years, uh, a diplomat with the U.S. State Department. But even since then, I feel like I've continued as a diplomat. Yes, was when I was ambassador to Vietnam, I was a diplomat. When I served in other parts of Asia, I was a diplomat working for the State Department. But even after that, when I worked for Google, I felt like I was still working as a diplomat because what I was doing was working with governments and explaining Google to governments. Now that I'm at the U.S. ASEAN Business Council, I still feel like a diplomat. I work with the 10 embassies in Washington that, that uh, represent the Southeast Asian nations who have ambassadors here. And uh, I work with governments in the region that represent those 
those 10 nations. We have, uh, we have six offices in Southeast Asia and we have offices in Washington and New York. Um, but the job is, it's really remarkable. It's a continuation of what I've done my whole career, which is try to serve as a bridge between the United States and that part of the world, that very dynamic part of the world that is the Asia Pacific. Uh, I feel like now the difference is instead of representing the United States government, I'm representing 175 companies worth $7 trillion, employing 15 million people. So I've got the weight of the private sector behind me instead of the weight of the US government. Um, but all of it has been to me just joyful. My job is to make friends for the United States. I love doing that. In Vietnam, it was the most fun because I was trying to help turn an old enemy into a new friend. And that's really the job of a diplomat, you know, to find out where interests converge, where friendships are possible, where you can do things together and build trust and build partnership. So, you know, now, uh, now I do it with the 10, the 10 countries of ASEAN, and that matters to the United States. The, the economic growth is really fast in that part of the world. So US businesses are very focused on what can they do in Southeast Asia? In fact, we have more, there's more US investment in Southeast Asia than there is in China, Japan, Korea, and India combined. So our companies are already there but a lot of them need help kind of navigating the space that is Southeast Asia. And because I was a diplomat for so long, I'm very comfortable uh, with helping them navigate that space. It's also strategically important to the United States because, uh, well, we have, we, there's competition in the region, you know I'm talking about, uh, and there's competition on the economic front as well as on the kind of strategic front. But when we made friends with Vietnam, for example, we were making friends with a nation that's strategically important as well as economically important. Um, I, Nikki asked me, um, what are the, she said, you know, what are the upsides of working as a foreign service officer? And maybe uh, Ambassador Kavisky spoke a little bit about this. To me, it's very exciting to learn about a new culture and not just to learn about it kind of in books and from a distance. But once you've learned the language and you live in a country, you get under the skin. You get to really learn about a, a new and different culture, what makes it special, what, the, what parts of the history are relevant in making the people who they are. And I love that. I love that everywhere I had the, the privilege of serving. But she also asked, what are the downsides of life in the Foreign Service? And I have to acknowledge, you know, there are there are tough parts, especially for families. You know, we, if you pick up and move every three years to a new embassy, a new country, a new culture, that can be disconcerting to, to families. Uh, I also think that it has its benefits, like the kids who uh, grow up in, in other countries speak different languages. They're often referred to as third culture kids. Uh, my daughter used to come back from Montessori school singing in Mandarin singing in Mandarin Chinese, you know, and she had friends who spoke Japanese and French and Korean and Chinese. And I, you know, that makes her a citizen of the world. So that's an upside. And I, I met my husband through my profession. Uh, I also see that as an upside. And Nikki, uh, finally, she asked, you know, what are the characteristics of a, of a good foreign service officer? And I think being curious is a really important characteristic, wanting to learn about a new place. That matters a whole lot. If you're interested in how the world works, well, the Foreign Service is a pretty great profession. I loved it. Um, yeah, so I think that that uh, those are probably the the answers to the main questions that you asked. Well, that's a great intro, Ambassador. Thanks a lot for that. We do have some uh, classrooms on. I'm going to encourage our participants to please chat in your questions to Ambassador Osius. It's an extraordinary opportunity to get his insights on things that you want to know, be that about the U.S. Foreign Service, diplomacy, Asia, ASEAN, the, the private sector in Asia. Um, so there's a lot of things uh, that uh, the ambassador is covering. 
I'm going to kick one off though, uh, Ambassador. I really love what you said about your job is to make friends for the United States, not just your diplomatic career, but currently. Now, most of us benefit by when we make friends by sharing a culture, sharing a language, and, and in doing so, we kind of have some understanding. But um, in your work, both in diplomacy and what you're doing now, uh, you're dealing with people of uh, many different cultures, different languages, uh, different ways and means. Can you talk a little bit about what that means to you, how you deal with it, and advice you might have for students who are engaging in the same world but feel a little bit daunted by that prospect? Well, maybe I'll, I'll just use a story to illustrate that. When I first went to Vietnam, this is almost 30 years ago, the traffic moved at the speed of a bicycle. There weren't very many cars. There were very few motorbikes. And I happened to like biking. So I bicycled from Hanoi to Saigon, about 1,200 miles. And it was like, it was a great way to learn about Vietnam and to make friends. I, we had people on the, on the trip who were Vietnamese, who were American, who were from New Zealand. You know, we had, it was an, a kind of an international group. But everywhere you go, you stop and you meet people. And because I, I speak Vietnamese, uh, I, you know, we were kind of like the circus coming to town every time we would, we would bike into a place. But I got to talk with people all along the road and learn about what was happening in the country. It made me feel much more connected to Vietnam. And then I went back 17 years later as ambassador. And guess what I did? I kept biking. You know, so I biked in the north, in far north. I biked once from Hanoi to Hue, which is about 600 miles. I biked in the center of the country. I biked in the south. And it was the same thing. I got to know people, you know, farmers, people who were selling things by the side of the road. I got to talk to people. I got to bike with people. Sometimes kids would ride along with me and we'd talk for, for ages. There were, there were these really energetic kids who hiked up to one of the highest, they biked up to one of the highest passes in Vietnam and they rode down with us. And then we you know, stayed together, spent uh, hours together and they were trying to figure out their future. Uh, and it was wonderful, magical. And I guess the key is like doing something that you like. For me, that's biking. And then when you can, learning the language, because the language is the key. And I found speaking Vietnamese was the key. That's why I loved, I loved serving in Vietnam. And I loved all the other places I served too. But the place where I knew the language best was Vietnam. And that made a difference. And Ambassador, in the other places, or maybe in Vietnam when you began, maybe you weren't such a good speaker of the local language. Was that difficult for you? How did you overcome that? Well, it depends on the country. Uh, in the Philippines, for example, I spoke a little bit of Tagalog, but the one language that unifies the Philippines is English. And there are all kinds of people who, if, even if their first language is in English, they want to improve their ability to speak in English. So I always had people in the Philippines uh, who, were, who wanted to talk with me in English. Same goes for India. There are many languages spoken in, in India. I spoke a little Hindi. Um, but I don't speak the other local languages. And the unifying language of India is also English. I mean, we are lucky as Americans because we're kind of the language of choice. The for, if anybody who wants to study a foreign language usually wants to study English. So, but if, even if you know just a little bit, a little Hindi in India or a little Tagalog in the Philippines, it helps just to get things rolling. And you know, get a conversation started, and then usually people will want to try out their English and and speak to a native English speaker. That's that's a wonderful story. And by the way, that great uh, biking story. Um, prior to uh, starting this program, the ambassador did share with me that he biked from Missoula to Billings one time. Yes, and so beautiful. He's got some Got some Montana miles on him as well. Um, Ambassador, we're very lucky to once again uh, welcome the students from Bozeman High School who uh, they were not with us in person last year at Academic World Quest, but are uh, renowned amongst the state as some of the best and brightest and most engaged in international affairs. So you will not be surprised that their questions are of a high order. Question Good. from Bozeman High. Do you anticipate China trying to domestically produce their own semiconductor chips 
or increasing the pressure on Taiwan's TSMC industry to claim their own benefit? So it's a really good question. The Chinese are moving ahead in a lot of advanced technology areas. They're really good at artificial intelligence. They are already producing their own chips, but not in isolation. They have Their supply chain is integrated with that of Southeast Asia and with other parts of the world. And of course, they rely on Taiwan uh, for a lot of the semiconductors uh, that they use in, in industry. And actually, that's what's created a huge opportunity in where I work, uh, because now countries like uh, Malaysia, Malaysia is really good at packaging chips. See, they get the, the chips and they have to be packaged this is the final step before they can be put into our cars and our phones. And the Malaysians uh, do that very, very well. They have a, an agreement with the United States so that they're a trusted supplier to the United States. Vietnam, Intel, uh, com the Intel company produces more chips, overseas chips, in Vietnam than anywhere else. They've invested $3 billion in the country. They have a big plant outside of Ho Chi Minh City. I visited it and they produce a lot of chips there. The Indonesians are now stepping up. They want to produce computer chips. They've got all the ingredients. They've got the human talent. They want to step up. Philippines, same thing. So what we're seeing is a, a response around the region to the fact that you don't want to rely entirely on one source for something that is so, so crucial to the world economy. Ambassador, you had a 30-year career in the U.S. Foreign Service, so this question, also coming from some of our students, asks, what was your journey of moving up and through the Foreign Service to uh, becoming an ambassador? So I you, usually you get to kind of ask, where do you want your first assignment to be? And I spoke Arabic, and I think there was an assumption that I would go to the Middle East. But I thought hard about it, and this is uh, this is 30 years ago, and I thought, you know, I'm a political officer. I want to report from places where there's good news as well as bad news. And I was afraid there would be a lot of bad news coming out of the Middle East. And when I looked at Asia, I thought, oh, you know, there are good stories, bad stories. There are, you know, in-between stories. There's just great poverty, and there's also great wealth. There's so many things that are moving in, in Asia. And so I chose... The Philippines is my first assignment because I wanted to learn about Asia, never turn back, never look back. The rest of my career I spent in Asia because it's so dynamic and so interesting. So I served in, in the Philippines, I served in, in Thailand, twice in Vietnam, Indonesia, India, I worked on Korea, I worked on Japan, at Google I was in Singapore. So really my, my career was spent in Asia, mostly in Southeast Asia. And that was my choice. And when at one point I was offered the chance to go to Vietnam where we were just opening up diplomatic relations, I volunteered. And that turned out to be a really important decision because then later on when, it, when that ambassadorship came up, I was, I was eligible, I spoke Vietnamese. There were 12 people who wanted to be ambassador to Vietnam at that time. They were all senior to me, but only one of the 12 spoke Vietnamese. That was me and I got to go. Uh, so it was about going where I was excited to go. And I, people, you know, people advise, you know, if you think we well, are gonna make your career by going this job to this job to this job and that'll make you ambassador. Someone told, gave me really good advice right at the beginning, which is choose jobs based on what excites you. Because if you're passionate about it, you'll do really well, and then your career will do well. And so that was my watchword. I chose jobs at every stage based on where I thought I would learn the most and have the most fun. That's great advice, Ambassador. We've not heard that one before, but I would tell our students to keep that in mind, whether you are interested in a career in the Foreign Service or otherwise, that advice would hold true no matter what you do. I think um, so. Next question is, um, what were the biggest changes, cultural or otherwise, that you noticed when you returned to Vietnam? When I returned? Yeah, so I went away for 17 years and then came back, and it was much wealthier. I mean, there were, when I'd first gone, we were 
when I rode bicycles, everybody was riding bicycles. And I came back to a country that had many, many more cars, many more motorbikes, and had Hermes and Louis Vuitton st stores where there used to be little tiny mom and pop shops. So it had grown much more prosperous in the intervening years. And that's not an accident. The United States helped bring Vietnam into the world economy. The other big change was that there was an internet. When I first was there, you know, I would write letters home and it would take forever for them to get home. And then I would get another letter, you know, a couple of weeks later. And the internet was very much in its infancy. When I go, went back as ambassador, the internet was thriving and every Vietnamese person had a cell, had a smartphone. And, every, and there were millions, I think 60 million people on Facebook communicating about pretty much everything. So it went from not very much information reaching the ordinary citizen to via the internet, huge amounts of information. It's a one party system. And I used the fact that the, the internet was so ubiquitous and Facebook was, was, was everywhere to communicate directly with Vietnamese people, sometimes right over the heads of the government. And it worked really well. Uh, it made the government stand up and pay much more attention to the US ambassador. <laughs> That's a great example. Um, ambassador, uh, we did speak with Ambassador Kabisky earlier, and she mentioned but didn't go into much detail on the bidding system and the way in yeah. which one in the Foreign Service, you know, finds a new duty station. But then also you've mentioned a bit about, you know, putting your name forward for an ambassadorship. The question from a student is maybe to ask you to to um, detail that a little bit more. Could you give us a little more sense of what that process looks like? Sure. They try to make it as kind of fair and transparent a system as possible. Like joining the Foreign Service, you take an exam. Everybody takes the same exam. It's fair. It's transparent. It doesn't matter what school you went to or who you know. You get in based on the results of the exam. It really is a merit. Uh, uh, meritocracy. And that kind of continues uh, throughout. Yes, it helps if you know people, because then you can rely on people for good recommendations. It's a kind of a collegial system. And if someone is choosing between two officers for a job, and they hear from someone they know really well that this officer is really great, that'll have an influence on their decision. Uh, but at every stage, you're you're kind of thinking, well, what might I do next? And then you, there are lists that come out and you find out what jobs you can bid on. And then you actively work and you, you, know, you introduce yourself to the potential future employer and you urge others to recommend you for jobs. When it comes to being an ambassador, it's a little bit of a different process. Uh, you have to go through a committee where multiple candidates are brought to the committee, but then this, then it's a little bit similar. You also wanna have recommendations to that committee by people who know the quality of your work. In my case, you know, I, I asked a number of people to let the folks on the committee know that I spoke Vietnamese, that I, you know, uh, I was a good officer. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd learned, I, I cared about every job I was in. I made a difference in every job that I was in. And that helped a lot. And I ended up getting my dream job. I, I'll tell you, Chris, it was a dream come true for me to go to, <laughs> go to this country that I loved, to go back to it as ambassador, this country where I, I spoke the language and I and enjoyed so much my first tour. It was a dream come true. There was no job I wanted more than to go back to Vietnam as ambassador. And I had the great privilege to do so. I, I love that story, Ambassador. You know, it it's magical in a certain sense, but there's not necessarily magic to it that, of course, you worked hard, you gained the skills you needed, yeah. you did the things you were passionate about. That's not necessarily magic. That's just, you know, that, that's a good way to live. That's a good way to work. And, and you know, good things come to people, uh, you know, hopefully who uh, follow that way. More well, there was one element of magic that I should mention. When I joined the Foreign Service, people who were gay and out didn't get to become ambassadors. In fact, there was a time early on where people would lose their security clearances for being who they were. 
that the piece of magic was that had changed by the time I was nominated to be ambassador to Vietnam, my sexuality and the fact that I was married to a man made not a whit of difference. It was about quali uh, qualifications for the job. That was what was significant. But to me, that was magic because if I would tried to do that 10 or 15 years before, I would have fallen short. But I was able to go with my husband and with my children and be very successful being and just being who I was in Vietnam. And so that felt to me, that felt magical. That's a great example of an extraordinary change within a system, yes. um, you know, for, for all kinds of reasons that, you know, leads to, to your career path. Thanks for sharing that with us, Ambassador. I've got to jump into some of these other questions. They're coming okay. fast and furious. Good. Uh, here's one right off the front pages of the newspapers. How does something like the Chinese spy balloon impact the job of an ambassador? Uh, well, it impacts it a lot. If you're ambassador to China, I'm sure Nick Burns is now our ambassador to China. He's a great, great, great diplomat. I'm sure that has been his obsession ever since that balloon was spotted. Uh, if you're ambassador to China, you also have access to intelligence. Uh, you're able to learn what uh, you know what that balloon's doing. Now, I'm sure that the ambassador to China knows exactly what that balloon was was doing. I'm sure that uh, the folks in the White House knew, and the State Department and the Defense Department knew exactly what that balloon was about. We can only speculate. You know, we I expect that balloon was taking pictures and sending them back to intelligence analysts. But you know, I don't know. I don't have a security clearance anymore in my current position. I, I can tell you though. It would have affected the, the lives of everybody who was working on China. And it affected the life of our Secretary of State. He was scheduled to go to China and the balloon derailed that very carefully planned trip that the Secretary of State uh, was going to take to China. So it, it derailed a whole diplomatic effort that had been underway ever since uh, President Biden and President Xi met in Bali uh, last fall. And you know, we were we were a little bit involved at the margins because we were encouraging the White House, if you're going to have this meeting with President Xi, have it in a democracy. Indonesia is a democracy. They would love to host you. Do it there. And they did. I don't know if it's because we recommended it or or what, but they they made that decision. And it felt for a while like we were getting back on a good track with China. And then this balloon really got us off track. So undoubtedly, in your experience, Ambassador, you've also lived and worked through a number of these experiences. This question asks, how has being ha having been an ambassador changed your outlook or perspective on the world and current issues today? Well, uh, when you're an ambassador, you are the president's personal representative. So there's kind of no dodging it. You've got responsibility for that relationship more than anybody else. In fact, when you're ambassador, you outrank anybody in that country, the country to which you're accredited, except the president of the United States. You even outrank the vice president and all the cabinet members. Now you still show them deference. You still, still show them respect. But the truth is you've got the ultimate responsibility. I took that seriously be, uh, in particular because I knew the history well. I knew that decisions made by the an earlier ambassador, Graham Martin, when he was there when the, during the fall of Saigon, led to people dying who didn't need to die. And so I took really seriously the responsibility of making the right decisions. I also felt a little bit freed. You no longer had to worry too much about checking everything with Washington. Uh, yes, I would keep Washington informed about what I was doing, but I had responsibility for the relationship more than anybody else. And so when I thought it was, you know, it was the, the right way to do a certain thing, that's what I pursued, unless told otherwise. Uh, because very often, especially if you're an ambassador to a kind of middle-sized country, rather than say ambassador to China, or, uh, uh, you, you have quite a bit of freedom to decide what's the best for the United States, what's the best path you can take for the United States. So I took that responsibility seriously, but I also enjoyed the freedom of making decisions and then going forth and implementing them. Ambassador, in your opening remarks, you mentioned um, 
curiosity as an yes. important quality. Now, it's what I'm picking up in this fascinating week of talking with so many different people is that's a very common thread. Maybe not surprisingly that if one is looking for an international career, having a bit of curiosity and uh, uh, being adventuresome is helpful. Yes. Now, I wonder if you might also share uh, with our students other qualities, characteristics, or maybe you know academic paths or skills or things now that you would think would be useful for anybody who is interested in engaging in an international career? Well, people who are preparing for the foreign service exam need to know a little economics. And so I, I feel like that's a skill that matters because economics actually helps you understand how the world works. Now, you don't have to be an economist to be a good diplomat. Uh, my view is if you could read the, the weekly news magazine, The Economist, and understand the vocabulary that's used in that magazine, that's enough. If you know what comparative advantage means, and you know a few of the economic terms, you're going to be able to do well on the foreign service exam. So some understanding doesn't have to be really high level, but some understanding of economics, I think, is really, really useful uh, for a foreign service career. Uh, people will say it's it's really good to be outgoing if you're going to be a diplomat, but I've known some really introverted people who've been great diplomats because they're good listeners. They and and one of the skills you need to be a good diplomat is to be a good listener at the right time. To hear what signals your counterparts are delivering to you, because it's not just about your agenda; it's also about theirs. Now, I discovered this when I went to Vietnam and I was all ready. I had my 100 day plan and I, you know, I talked about it with lots of Americans. But once I got to Vietnam, I discovered, oh, they really have an agenda, too. And I need to understand their agenda. So it, that also, I think, involves curiosity, the willing, you know, being ready to listen, being curious about what the, your counterparts are interested in, what matters to them most. So, and then I think EQ matters. I think being able to kind of size up a situation and work with a person, develop trust with a person, that's crucial because, uh, you know, diplomacy isn't just about money and power. Some, some people may think it is, but it's not. It's about building trust. Very fundamental human relations are involved. And if you, when you can strengthen trust, you can do a heck of a lot for the United States. Well, you just struck another common chord that every one of our guests has mentioned, which is this human element, this critical element in all international careers, which is about engaging other people, not simply systems or spreadsheets or documents, but being able to work directly with, with humans. And so, yes. you know, that that's a, it's really interesting to hear these very similar suggestions from a wide range of experts. Ambassador, uh, we're coming to an end here, and I just want to thank you very much once again for sharing your personal um, stories, your professional stories, your insights that are helping our students and our community members here not only understand the world a little bit better, but maybe chart their own path into an international career. That's what uh, we're trying to do this week. So let me thank quickly the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, Allegiance, First Interstate Bank, Trail West Bank, QFI, the High Stakes Foundation, and the Longview Foundation, who help us bring this and many more programs to you. Ambassador Osius, once again, sincere thanks to you uh, for coming onto our show. We are looking forward to your return in person to Montana. Maybe we can bike together. Chris, it's been a <laughs> It's been a real pleasure. I've loved uh, rejoining you virtually, and I hope to see you in person again. We hope so, too. So everybody, remember, we have one more day of International Careers Week with an extraordinary range of uh, amazing guests, not the least of whom is Carol Spann, the director of the United States Peace Corps, who's going to join us tomorrow. So uh, you're in very good company, Ambassador. Thanks again, and thank you all for watching. Be well. Bye-bye.